My name is Jay Hanna, and this is the Omaha Dynamic Language Users Group, uh, August 14th, 2012. And uh, what I'm presenting tonight is a, I'm representing with permission, some uh, Perl Training Australia materials. And we're just, well, all of these materials are online, and so you're very much encouraged to go through the full package of materials and and hire these guys um, for uh, corporate training because they're they do a really good job and I was so impressed with it that I thought we'd gloss over a bunch of these items and then dive into whatever parts that that people were interested in so the the subject of Jacinta's talk I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly or not uh, is uh, the putting that ideas ideals ideas together I, I sat for for two hours this talk was a two-hour talk at yet another Pearl Conference in North America 2012 in Madison. And I was very impressed with this talk um, and thought it was a great overview of a ton of stuff that if you're not familiar with it, you probably want to get familiar with uh, what these things are just so you can know whether or not you're interested in, in learning them. So uh, from the odlug.org website, my link goes to the talk. The talk... Uh, Summary links to pearltraining.com.au talks uh, piat.html. So here's where you grab all these resources, putting it all together. Uh, that URL is this. This is the website of the putting it all together talk that Jacinta uh, presented. And then that was other stuff I was doing. And from here, this was a two hour session. And these are the things you would need to go through all of the uh, items here. And this exercises, comma, answers, and PDF file, um, you can download from that website. And you'll get uh, this PDF, which is 78-page overview and detail of all of these amazing uh, things. And the, the list of the chapters uh, covered here, or covered in that talk, was, was these. And she went very quickly because a lot of these things get pretty deep. But, you know, you're very much encouraged to grab the, the PDF at least uh, because that's what we'll be using to go through these things. And look at whatever uh, chapters you might find helpful and at least skim through all the chapters so that you know uh, what it is that you're uh, not using if you decide not to use these things. You should probably be familiar with this stuff if you're uh, developing Perl in in the year 2012. So at least know what they these things all are. So I could tonight talk about all of this stuff except PAR. I'm not a package archive kind of guy. I've never played with PAR at all. The rest of these things I'm very familiar with. But I thought tonight we would probably uh, stick with the uh, the Moose chapter, which is chapter 10. Uh, but if anyone wants to go over any of these things, other than the moose thing, we can do that as well. So th this is the the PDF. <clears throat> oh, so Autodie, the art of Klingon programming. So the the two minute cap recap of this, if you don't have the PDF in front of you, is that, or I guess I can scroll to it in the PDF too. But the the idea of Autodie is that a lot of times while you're writing source code you're going to be writing things that say uh, open this file or die, write to this file or die, close this file or die, do this or die, do that or die, and the, the auto die module, and this is an amazing presentation, if you, if you get a chance uh, to see this, let's see, that's page 16, uh, Paul Fenwick does a presentation where he is in the room dressed as a uh, Starfleet uh, uh, ensign or someone, yeah, and does this whole presentation as a very theatrical presentation, uh, talking about the Klingon Empire and what they got right and what they got wrong in respect to uh, parole programming. So, I definitely recommend going to one of the many conferences that Paul attends anywhere in the world. Uh, Yapsi in North America is very cheap, very affordable to go to. And I've gone for the last four years now, I think, so 
I definitely recommend checking that out. Anyway, so <clears throat> I'm not going to do anywhere near justice to this, but the, the basic idea is that by using this thing called auto die, instead of writing a lot of code which says open or die or die or die, instead you use auto die and you can just open files and you can just close files and you don't have to do anything because the Klingon battle mentality is that if anything goes wrong, then extreme violence is immediately <laughs> called for and the Klingons will destroy everything and die for you. So, and apparently you can actually type a bunch of stuff in Klingon itself. I don't speak Klingon myself, but this is actually Perl syntax for things that I don't understand. And so if you want to do it in Perl, or sorry, in Klingon, you can do it actually in Klingon. So that's the basic. So is that, is that a decent two minute on auto die? So, so how does it know to, like on the line where it says open and you don't have or die, I guess I'm going to miss that part. How does it automatically? So, so by saying use auto die, you've imported a module that has overridden all of the default functionality of these of the the main I actually don't know how it works under the hood so, so I'm making this up that you would normally say ODI has, has done something to, those functions. To, to the extent I think that you can tell auto die like by default it does a bunch of default functions that are common oh is that in the PDF I, I grabbed the CPAN module and it becomes apparent how it works by looking at how you say use auto die QW close open So if you're not using metacpan.org, you should also check that out. Oh, wow. Yeah, search.cpan.org is a, is a good search site. metacpan.org is a community-driven one that's kind of the de facto, hey, use this, guys, kind of thing. It's open source. That's one of the big pushes for metacpan.org. Search.cpan.org is closed source. So anyway, yeah, apparently, and I don't, I don't, I've never actually used Autodie. I'm just vaguely familiar with it and played with it. Um, these are all the categories that you can control. So if you do or do, don't want these things to have the default behavior, whatever the default behavior is, you can change Autodie to do or not do these things as you see fit and change the messages and things is my understanding so all right so moving on um instead of auto die i thought we'd do the moose stuff because that's probably one of the most uh try to win, the open. win you over to moose Um, so how, like your typical program that you write, how many lines of code and how many files are you dealing with? Uh, I have 3K, I'd say, and 2K. Oh, so yeah, you've got 5,000 bytes or lines or what, of yeah. source code? Yeah. So how are, so how are, are you not doing object-oriented at all, or are you rolling your own? Yeah, so you, d you define your own sub new and say, bless this anonymous hash ref. Yes, and actually, it was really whatever. annoying to get uh, uh, the super class is a new method to get called during my new method. That's not like about the ref. You don't have to worry about that. So uh, it's making you not have to worry about references versus you know, class versus instance and super class things just getting called. <laughs> yeah, I don't. <laughs> I'm probably not enough of an expert to generalize <laughs> across all of those things. I can, I can tell you that in a previous life, um, where I spent 10 years programming, we weren't doing any object-oriented code at all. We discovered Damian Conway's book in about the year 2000, hey, Andy's coming, and uh, object-oriented uh, programming with Perl or something. I forget what Damian Conway's book's called, uh, the O'Manning Press one. Um, and he went into, here's how you do all of your auto-load kind of craziness to auto-define all your methods and objects and all of that. And we wrote all of that for three years, and then we discovered Moose, and boy, it was just so much cleaner. 
um, the the internal guts of what we were doing because we were uh, we were making some very complicated objects appear out of nowhere, out of thin air, uh, which is all great until something goes terribly wrong. And our internal framework, our internal crazy framework that we wrote with code that we couldn't read, you know, two weeks later, um, was not nearly as tested as Moose is, because <laughs> Moose has who knows how many tens of thousands of tests inside itself. Uh, so yeah, we were really happy when we when we abandoned the thing that we wrote and, and went to Moose instead. So I'd, I'd have to look at your specifics, and but you know I, I don't. I, I think you'd be happy with it if, if you check it out. So I was gonna spend probably an hour just kind of on this chapter, going through this stuff. Um, before I jump straight in, or before I focus on Moose specifically, did anyone want? quick summaries of any of these other sections or I can't speak to par at all um, <clears throat> the, I don't use Pearl Critic we did at my previous job um, so I don't currently use it I haven't been using it for a while so it's pretty nice and it does auto cleaning for you so like if you're feeling insanely lazy uh, you can have it clean your programs which is kind of nice too so ju I mean just formatting wise so I can go through and kind of Perl tidy them up. I think Perl tidy is part of Perl critic. That could be wrong. That could be a separate module, separate binary. Anyway, um, <clears throat> if you're not using CPAN minus, you probably should be. Um, and if you're not using Perl brew, you probably should be. So just on this installing modules from CPAN thing and what we were talking about a little bit earlier. Is that big enough? Um, so, so Perl Brew, like we were talking about earlier, is a nice little manager for multiple versions of Perl itself and libraries thereof. So what we have here is I've got Perl 5.16.0 installed, and I've got Perl 5.16.1 installed. And were you, did you say you're using 5.8.3, maybe? Oh, uh, am I wrong place? Yeah, 5.8. So if, if you wanted that, uh, you could just type that and it would put 583 in your list hopefully that works um, but I just I just noticed that 1 was out two hours ago and so that's all I typed uh, Pearl Brew install 1 and I got 1. so the little asterisk indicates which one I'm on so if I type Pearl V it says hey I'm on 1 and then I say Pearl Brew use 5.16.0 and Perl v and now I'm on 5.16.0. So if there's a specific version that I know is compatible with my stack, I can flip around. So then the little at signs are library sets. So if in my 5.16.0 I have a specific module version, like I think I, let's see, did I draw? Yeah. So earlier today, I installed Acme iDrops version 1.60. And if I'm on Perl 5.16.0 and I require that and tell Perl to execute my program, which is the string 1, then it doesn't complain. But if I Perl brew use over to uh, an old version, 5.16.0 old library set and try to use 5.60 it's going to tell me that in my old my uh, at old library set that we only have version 1.55 of this module and not 1.60 so with this I can track not only multiple versions of Perl but multiple versions of my known dependencies so if I know that this set needs this I can go in this library or this library or whatever. So if you've if you've heard of uh, local lib, um, these at signs, at foo, at old, are actually local lib libraries that Perl Brew is managing for you. So if you if you hear of local colon colon lib as the way to keep track of all of your library stuff, that is true. Uh, Perl Brew does that for you in recent versions of Perl Brew, which is kind of nice. If you're not familiar with Perl Brew at all, uh, PerlBrew.pl is the website. 
So it's really easy to get going. This is all it takes to install Pearl Brew, sorry, Pearl Brew. Uh, and away you go. So Pearl Brew was very cool. I'd check it out. Um, CPAN minus CPAN M is a replacement that works differently from cpan.pm, which is the de facto kind of installer. Uh, and but it does a lot of things differently. I'm not an expert in cpanm. I just use it all the time now. A lot of times it tracks the dependencies a little bit better than the de facto installer. Um, and it definitely has a prettier uh, install dialog set. So if you're not using CPAN minus, I would also uh, check that out as far as getting modules to CPAN. So that, that's the summary, I think, of, of chapter two. I don't know anything about PAR. We talked about Autodie. There's this thing called Autobox, which is pretty crazy and not Moose. It's a different thing. So if you want all of your primitives to become objects, Autobox does that. It's kind of kooky. So if you want to define Prints or dot hello or what are arrow hello methods on a string, you can do that in this with Autobox. So check that out in the PDF. Just you know, go through it for five minutes. I think you'll find it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so the just real quick, installing from the CPAN, Pearl Brew is what we talked about. Local lib is the other big thing, and that's what Pearl Brew lib is. That's what those at signs are, and Pearl Brew handles local lib for you, just so you know. And then it talks about CPAN M, which is awfully convenient. And I don't know anything about PAR, so I'm skipping that. Oop. We talked about Autodie. Let me get down to Autobox, wherever that is. So instead of writing, so this is the two minute summary of Autobox, instead of writing say join with space the reverse of split of a space of a string using autobox your string your scalar suddenly has this method called split which you can then reverse and you can join and then say that yeah so this is much easier to read left to right kind of chaining whatever, blah, 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 and you couldn't do it with Perl 5 vanilla, so yeah. So if you use Moose to make your things objects, then of course you can define these methods and there you go. Or you can use this thing called Autobox and suddenly all of your primitives have all this stuff by default. I don't, I don't know if you can do both or not. <laughs> Good luck. Let us know how that goes. I look forward to your presentation next month about your... <laughs> uh, chapter 6 is really cool. Um, this is Chapter 6 printed out, if anyone wants to check that out. But if you're big into regular expressions, you can do some really cool things nowadays with modern pearls. Uh, so you can define all of these regular expressions. <clears throat> and regular expressions have always been insanely powerful uh, but you can get into grammars and such which this goes into which I don't really understand terribly well yeah since 510 I think I'm not which is pretty old at this point several years old yeah 58 is like yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's been a while. So anyway, all this definitely grab this PDF seriously and take a look at it because this is this is an amazing overview of just all kinds of stuff. All right. Oh, so chapter eight is 
the New York Times profiler, which you run your code through the profiler and it kicks out a website-based dump. I ins installed it all. Any, so anyway, it's all point and clicky and you can click around and see what methods are getting called how many times and whatever and how much time they're taking and all that stuff. So I, I just installed that uh, as I was walking away. Let me see if it actually works. Uh, so, just an example of Acme Ida. I, I thought I spent 20 minutes on this before I left earlier today. So here's here's a little program that I wrote for my wife because my wife couldn't decide if she wanted the the uh, walls to be red or green downstairs. So she needed a little help. So I wrote her this little program, and what this program does is it randomizes whether the walls are going to be red or green, and then she hits a key, and it tells her. So not too much going on here. This is just term read key, and I don't even care what the key is. I just care that a key got struck. So the color is the int of rand2, and it's either red or green, and that's it. And then it's very explicit about the end result. <clears throat> so Acme Eye Drops is this fun thing where sometimes source code is really ugly, and you would rather look at a very pretty version of your source code. And so here I'm saying, hey, this wallcolor.pl, I want this in the shape of a camel. And so when I, when I run this eyedrops program and kick it out to a file called pretty, it changes my source code. And now my source code looks like this. See these camels? Aren't, aren't camels pretty? So now I can run this pretty version, and it does the same thing. Yeah. Isn't that handy? So if you want it to look like Larry Wall's face, or Buffy the Vampire Slayer, or whatever, these are all options. But anyway, the reason I, other than that being cute, the reason that I showed you that is because I was just curious what would happen if I actually develop NYT prof both of those. I was just, I was just curious what, what it would do. Because I'd never done that before, and it, it occurred to me, hey, what would that do? No, so N NYT prof is a profiler that's going to tell me, oh. like, if a chunk of my program is taking too long. Hopefully it's going to tell me why it's taking too long. Now, apparently Metas... Uh, oops. Apparently, MetaCPAN doesn't like Devel NYT Prof's documentation for some reason. And I forgot how to use it because I haven't used this in a while. Okay, so here's how you use the NYT profiler. So I want to use that on my original program. Installed it into 5.16.1. Oh, so here's CPAN minus in action because I didn't install the dependency of my. So CPAN minus instead of like the traditional CPAN, that's all the output. So your system administrators might find CPAN M much cleaner to use than uh, the traditional CPAN, and there's not a ton of configuration and stuff. It assumes all the defaults. So you can still dork with the defaults if you want to, but you don't have to by default. Like the first time you run, I, I don't know how you guys are doing package management, but anyway, CPAN minus is very cool. So check that out. Anyway, so let's let's try to profile my... So when I profile a running program, it kicks out this NYT prof out, right? And then now that I have that, I want to do like a HTML dump of that NYT prof. So now here's the 
New York Times profiler evaluation of that program that I just ran. So we did 32,000 calls to term read key, read key, set no delay, etc. So if, if one of these things in exclusive time was taking 15 seconds, if my job was taking 20 seconds and one of these things was taking 15 seconds, I'd see that in the, this list. And by clicking to it, it pops down to the actual source code of that uh, system. And I can look at the statements and go to that line or that block or that subroutine and look at all of these reports uh, for each of these subroutines. And here's the actual source code with a ton of comments added, right? Where it's giving me for every single statement, how many times was it invoked? How long did it take? How much time did we sit there, et cetera? So th this is a trivial program without a, you know, but if, if we did another little program and we said sleep 10 in the middle of a program that took 11 seconds, then it should pop right out as a, at, with a profiler like NYT Prof. So if you haven't checked out NYT Prof, check it out. It's pretty cool. Um, so that's that whole chapter. Uh, so Pearl Critic, the, are you guys actually using Pearl Critic? Is that, somebody said Pearl Critic earlier. Oh, yeah, I, I just mentioned it because I thought it was on there before. Oh, yeah. No, we don't actually Pearl Critic. Do you know what it does? Uh, Carbs about all the things that you're doing in your code that it doesn't think are yeah. Is it like a linter? Yeah. But and you and you can set it like so if you disagree so the, the yeah, by default, you know, whatever. But if you like it that way, if you like your semicolons there, you know, whatever you can tell it to shut up, or you can enforce a rule that's not the default rule, etc. So so Pearl Critic, uh, there there's a there's a another book by uh uh uh, Damien Conway called Pearl Best, Best Practices, which is about this thick. It's the Hound Dog book from O'Reilly. And uh, that book goes through what it feels are the best practices to use in your development. And that's what Pearl Critic implements by default. And so Pearl Critic will go in and it'll set warnings or explosions or whatever on however nasty you want Pearl Critic to be. So anyway. And then testing module, I, I've, I've talked about testing a few times in the last couple of years. So always write tests for your stuff and test harnesses are very nice and convenient in Perl. And so if you haven't used uh, test more and prove and all that good stuff, you should definitely check those out too. And test driven development is awfully handy. Uh, is that, are you guys TDD driven? Yeah, we like to be. Yeah. I'd say we're TDD. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> after it rolls and it explodes, oh, it, no. it's TDD. Uh, I mean, when you're right, all of the modules will have tests as to whether or not you have 100% code coverage or whether the function has a test. That's depending on whether or not I felt like putting in the hiding system calls. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then Devel Cover will tell you what your code coverage is, and then your doc coverage and all kinds of stuff. So. Uh, yeah, so if you want tools that enforce, you know, everyone says Perl's ugly. Well, it doesn't have to be. If you want to enforce that it's not, you can if you want to. And develop cover will show you your coverage. So, anyway. Uh, da -da -da -da. So, this, this walks you, the PDF walks you through the basics, exercises, uh, subtests, and then this is a bunch of other stuff. So. Uh, it does like uh, one of the things I use all the time, which is kind of neat, is uh, CMP deeply, compare deeply, where you can take an arbitrary nested, complex nested structure and another arbitrary complex nested structure, and you can say compare deeply, and it'll look inside the array of the hash of the array of the hash of the hash of the object of the hash of the array and tell you, oops, that was supposed to say Baltimore, and for you it says Boston. And it'll actually tell you in a useful way that that's what happened, which is really very nice. 
Anyway, all right. Yeah. So a lot of time. Well, so yeah. There's so there's lots of ways to handle how do you want to test data, and how do I do I set up a big expectation database, right? And do I like flush that and reload it and then expect this to match that, or you know how do you? Uh, but yeah, the the testing libraries in Perl are are pretty impressive. Aha! All right, chapter ten. So this is what I was going to spend the majority of my time on. Moose is so easy. <laughs> this is all you need to know right here. Eight minutes. <clears throat> so a class is just a package. So all you need to say is that I'm in my playing card package and now I want to use Moose and you're done. Congratulations. <clears throat> when you want to instantiate that from somewhere else, you call the new method, which you didn't define because Moose defined it for you. All right? All right. So that's kind of handy. So you don't have to build your own constructors if you don't want to. Well, so now, yeah, so attributes. So what we're, the, the scenario we're in is a playing card, like a deck of cards. And the playing card has a suit, right? And this suit is read only, and this PDF format is a little wacky, but. Uh, so this is just uh, one attribute on this class, right? Which becomes an object. Here we're saying this, the suit is read only, and it's a string, and it's required, which means that you have to tell me what this is when you create the object or I'm going to explode. Huh? You're talking to me? Oh, okay. <laughs> Man, you guys. Um, creating the attribute also creates accessors and manipulators automatically, right? So card suit, and the parentheses are optional in Perl land, which tends to confuse C folks. In my experience, they yell at me. Um, here we're reading what the suit is, and if we had parentheses and the value foo in there or something, we'd be trying to set it. But we made this one read only, so that object's not gonna let us do that anyway, right? Now method is just a subroutine. So like any subroutine in Perl, when I have a playing card and I use Moose, I can define whatever subroutine I want and these become methods on my object. Myself as shift, I do whatever. Now here's how I'd use that. I'd use playing card, I'd grab a card, and I'd call show card, which would invoke this method. So just stop me with questions. How many, do I have six minutes left? <clears throat> All right. So the basic example, I got a playing card, I'm gonna use moose. I have one attribute called suit. It's read only, it's a string, it's required. I have another one called a value and I've got a one method called show card, which is gonna return the value of the suit. So it's gonna say two of clubs or whatever, right? When I can say no moose, you can or can't. If you, if you want to say no moose, then this has thing, like has is not a Perl 5 thing, right? Like that did not exist until I said use moose and it suddenly started existing. When I say no moose, I get rid of stuff like that. There's has and there's a lot of other stuff that's all moose specific. And if I'm defining a bunch of non moose type stuff, no moose wipes out all those uh, local uh, namespace effects. <clears throat> So now that we've got that, we can go, hey, here's my first card, it's an ace of hearts, the second card is a king of spades, show my card, show my card. If I try to change the suit to diamonds, it's an error because we flagged it as a read only, right? Uh, so your is can be read only or read write, meaning you can actually set it after the fact. R O O or R W. So here, visible is going to be read-write and it's boolean, so I'm going to be able to flip this one on and off after the fact. All right, so in Moose, all of your attributes are of a specific type. Unless it's any, I guess that's a specific type. Is any specific or is it not specific? 
Uh, so if I know it's going to be a Boolean, right? Boolean is an item. These things are items. These things are values. These things are references, etc. And this is the default tree. And you can check out Moose Util type constraints to see all the default ones. Now in Moose, when you have another type, like say I've got a business specific type uh, where I'm, you know, defining the 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 J column, right, which is my own personal ID or, or, or whatever, but the, my personal ID has to be the letter J and then the word rules and then and, uh, numeric, right? So now I'm defining a type that Moose doesn't have that's easy to define and enforce inside Moose. And I can define that as a type and then I can just say that this attribute is a, a J type or whatever I called that thing. I should come up with a good example for that. So we already had accessors. And manipulators. If you want, you can overwrite the default ones. So if, you, if, if instead of decoration paren, or with or without the parens, you wanted to, your reader to be get underscore decoration or to be foo barbaz or whatever you want it to be you can just declare the attribute has an explicit reader and moose makes that the reader now so the reader and the writer the manipulators and the accessors you can tell moose no it's not the default it's this and it'll still check all your type constraints automatically for you on the manipulators etc Okay, so there's two magical things that come up pretty much right away. So uh, build args is run before object construction, and then build is run at object construction. So if you're wanting to manipulate build args, if you're wanting to manipulate the arguments that are passed into you before Moose gets a hold of it, like in some, uh, you have some really strange case where, okay, yeah, normally I want the user to say queen, like Q-U-E-E-N, but sometimes I want my developers to be lazy and they're just going to hand me Q and I want to turn that into queen, that sort of thing. If you want to manipulate the arguments on the way in, then build args is a good way to do that. Oh, here's a better example. You really shouldn't be listening. Suit, core suit. Sorry, I don't use syntax highlighting, so if you guys are big on it, I'm just, I apologize. I've just never gotten used to it, so it confuses my, my old brain.
blow up very nicely. Oh, son of a bitch. So the first thing it's complaining at me about uh, is that suit is required. So when I defined my thing, I said, hey, this one's required, but when I tried to instantiate my object, they didn't provide it. So now, if I actually provide the suit, then it actually works. So now if I provide something that doesn't coerce, oops, I thought it would blow up. It is required, it is coercing. Card suit. Ah. Then card new suit has suit. Is read only is a via string to suit string to suit. Maybe that what it's Yeah, it's not changing it. It's keeping it as hearts. Like it doesn't care. I don't know why it's doing that. Probably because I'm doing this wrong somewhere. I will have to post to the mailing list when I have 15 okay, minutes to look at that. So doesn't that just say that it starts with an H or D or C and S? Oh, yeah. Thank you. So now it just says the container one of those things about a half a dollar time, right? Hey, I do Pearl for a living. Leave me alone. <laughs> So it didn't, I thought it was going to throw a coercion error or warning of some kind, and it doesn't look like it did. It coerced, it, it coerced, coerced it into undef because I had no key for hearts, All right? So I'd have to ask the moose, the moose guys why it doesn't bitch at me. I don't know, There's, there might be a way to make that mandatory or who knows. Anyway, so the, the point being that if you have uh, all kinds of custom types, <clears throat> that's all it takes, right? So here I've defined, oops, here I've defined a subtype called suit, which is a string, except it has to wear that. And that's all it takes. And then I say is a suit. And if this had to be an LWP user agent object, you just stick LWP user agent in there, and now that attribute has to be an LWP user agent object. And if this has to be an array of LWP user agent objects, that means it is a array of LWP user agent objects, etc. Yeah. All right. So, inheritance. So I'll probably wrap this up in about ten minutes or so. Inheritance says I have this object, and it inherits a bunch of behavior from another object, and I might instantiate the object or the uh, the subclass, parent class, root class, base class. 
I might instantiate either this class or the base class thereof. But instead of inheriting, uh, you can use roles, which says, I'm not going to instantiate roles. I just have a, uh, I'm not going to instantiate this thing. I just have a bunch of behavior that I want to encapsulate in this thing called a role. So in the previous example, teacher class is an abstract class. We don't really intend to create teacher objects. Instead, we want to add classes to represent each type of trainer. And this becomes a candidate for a role. So a role is defined all the same way with the subroutines and everything, but you never instantiate roles. Roles just have subroutines and attributes that apply to, to, to different classes. So, say what? The numbers? Yeah. The, these are optional, but you can use them if you want. Then, then has is still magical, and it's still moose rolly, gotcha. right? Has and extends and all of these things that moose is throwing into your namespace. You guys are very quiet over there. Did I hush you? Yeah. I didn't mean to shush you earlier. Well, maybe so. So. So the idea behind roles and duct typing, this gets towards duct typing, I think, but I'm no expert in OO frameworks. Um, if I've got this concept that something can be caffeinated, but caffeination itself is not something I would instantiate. Caffeination is an attribute of other things that I would want to instantiate. So like here, soap can be caffeinated and cola can be caffeinated and coffee can be caffeinated. So, look, I want objects for soaps and colas and coffees, and coffees and colas are beverages, but I'm never going to instantiate caffeination. Like, caffeination is not something I would do. So, coffee extends beverage, so this is inheritance. With caffeine, this is a role. So, depending on what you're doing, like if you're doing like a, I don't know, a D and D, well, I don't do D and D anymore, so I shouldn't go there. But the, <clears throat> if you have a bunch of functionality that a lot of different classes will use, that's kind of a thing that other classes do, but isn't really a thing you would instantiate, then just use a lot of roles. So nowadays we use just a ton of roles. We use a lot of roles for a lot of stuff. So it's, it's fancy that you can just, you know, pick and choose whatever you want, whatever roles you want in your class, and just apply all that stuff, and it just magically becomes part of your class, which I think is what duct typing is, generally speaking, isn't it? So a role, a role is an abstract class? It doesn't look like an interface because you actually implement something that has So I'm not clear on what an interface is in the computer science well, sort of. Well, you've never done, you've never been in a job before. No, I've never. <laughs> <laughs> well, a job interface doesn't really have anything in it, it just tells you the functions that you can call. Yeah, so. This looks like you get a little bit more power, but it's the same kind of like, there's a bunch of stuff that never is supposed to be instantiated. But, you know, yeah. But we can, but we can write a few helper functions. It's like the multiple inheritance that Perl does, only now you just have a single inheritance with a bunch of heavy weight interfaces. It seems like a mix, like, a, like not as hardcore as Java about it, but still offering some of the basis of trying to be your code more Yeah, and the, a role. 
I mean, as far as the moose syntax goes, <coughs> you say use moose to define a package or a, a class, and you say use moose role to define a role, and everything else is the same, okay. except extends versus with, and that's it. I mean, it, there's like very little syntax. So it's, it's very nice. It's, it's the kind of sh stuff you wish was in Perl 5. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's see, was this exploding? Oh. All right. Uh, I, I changed that to an LWP user agent object while while you guys were staring at your laptops. <laughs> All right, so here's Here's, I pass in a new playing card, suit hearts, right? And I say the card suit, and it says H, right? Because hearts got turned into H for efficient storage. So that's, that is what we expected. But if I also say, hey, package playing card, uh, use moose, and this, uh, what did you say, with? Is that what you said? With... So I can't locate it. Well, you try to say with something that already exists as a class. Yeah, like cast simple. It's pretty cool. I've never actually put more than one package in the file. Well, you wouldn't normally do this. <laughs> I mean, I know, I just, I actually, it didn't even occur to me, so I didn't know it was okay. Yep. Did you put a one in the end of the package, or you can get away with it? You can get away with it. Uh, let's do that. Oh, no. All right, so here. How do I make that a moose roll? Was anyone paying attention? Moose roll and roll. Oh. But isn't everything now going to be a roll beneath it because you can say no rolls? Well, I ended the package. So, so right there, it should be. Oh, okay. Because when the next package is going to be a roll. Yeah. Whenever you say package, Perl 5 okay, obliterates your namespace. Oh, so you should put package after all your use statements? No, no, no. no. no, no. So you would never actually do this. Okay. Yeah. You, you, normally, you'd have a jshininess.pm, which would be sitting there with four lines of code. Okay. And then you'd have a playing card.pm, right? Because if you do your stuff like this, you'll end up with source code that looks like camels. <laughs> you have one big run on. <laughs> but it's you know it's nice for demos to just say yeah, yeah, because yeah. The, because Perl five actually doesn't give a crap whether or not the stuff is split whether or not it's human readable right like it doesn't care it's if it's if it's actually you know if you say use foo colon colon bar it's going to look for a subdirectory called foo and it'll look for a, a file called bar.pm but if you already define package foo bar then there's nothing to do it's already it's already got it so it, so yeah don't pearl let you do all kinds of stuff you should not do <laughs> <laughs> like like anything in my demo, don't do it. All right. All right. So the last thing I'll talk about just real quickly is, <clears throat> so if you have a, a sub, well, let's see, are they going to give me a good example? Can we do any sort of super class calling? Can we look at that or not? Oh sure. So so real quickly, if you have code that you want to have run before a method. So if I've got a sub called foo, and I want to do something whenever foo is called, right, like right before foo is called, like right to a log file or something, which is the example they put here, you can just say before foo, and give it a sub, and it does whatever's in the sub. Is that a Java reference? <laughs> I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> I have no idea. 
gonna. But anything you want to have happen before, after, and then around, around is the special magical thing, where here this around log is saying, hey, around the call to log, and then self next, and self next is gonna be up your inheritance tree. And then we're still in around. Oh, that is actually super, super cool. Like, to the point where I might switch to this stuff. Ah! Because I, I think I ran into something today where I was like, man, I really just want to verify this every time that one of these functions gets called. Because maybe somebody screwed it up. Yep. And just go around this. Yep. And I don't have to go change it eight different places. Or yeah, and it'll cascade through everything. Yeah. And your builds all cascade through everything. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you've got a big inheritance tree, Right, um, you ne you don't have to tell it to build the other build. Moose builds all your trees for you. It, it's gonna do the build. It's gonna do the, all that stuff for you. So here's so like here's the output of that little thing above. About to log was before, right? The before invocations said about to log. Around said two things. It said this one and this one. Inside was the actual log call itself, and then this is the after. So those are all method modifiers. So yeah, around works like this one. So you can do whatever you want, and then you self-next. Okay. Self-next fires up the tree. And then whenever that stack is done, it's going to come back to the other half of a round. That would be a sweet way to trace. Oh, no. uh, so could you like a round open? So you have to like open. Let's see. Sorry, hold on, sir. close to that. Can't locate moose, so that's not good. Can't locate moose. <laughs> Wait, what?
Why did we have moose roll and not moose? How is that possible? <laughs> yeah, you would. <laughs> I must have done something very creative just there that I I didn't. <laughs> I must have done something very strange. Huh? Oh, this is a the pearl onion. Inside a deadhead skull, because I was staff last year or two years ago. <laughs> nice. So there's 21 distributions. So the CPAN minus is kind of nice if you haven't. So I gotta extend it with, with. Eight thirty. There's a bunch of stuff about method resolution order and C three, which is a whole other thing. And that was it. That was Moose. <laughs>